with the, and you can speak to this better than I can, Jeff, on the, on the other filters like the clip-in, the ones that you and I both use, the SCT Duo Band. Um, I live in a fairly light polluted. Hey, Brent, I just realized I forgot okay. to hit the go live button. <laughs> so we are live now. <laughs> But I, I don't know if it's recorded everything. I think it should have recorded, right? Everything since I started broadcasting? I don't, I don't know. Um, That's a good question. I can edit it out. Let's start over. How about that? Okay, that's fine. We, sorry about that. So we spent 17 minutes on this. All right. So let's go back to topic one. And, uh, yeah, we have... We have a, a few viewers on now, and so let's uh, let's go back to the start. Welcome, hey guys, I'm Jeff, Jeff Ball Photography. Thanks uh, for stopping by the channel. Hey, what we're going to do today is answer your questions about astrophotography with a modified DSLR camera. What drove this? I think we're at a sweet spot where the value in a modified DSLR camera and the techniques and the database that's available and the benefits you get from it are at a sweet spot of value. And if you have a camera in your possession that you think you would like to modify uh, for astrophotography, and we're going to get into what is modify, what's the benefits of modify, and you thought about doing it yourself, maybe you're a maker, maybe you like to tinker with things, then this is for you so if, if you're on the edge there to uh, consider whether or not you should uh, go down this rabbit hole of modifying your own DSLR. So joining me is an expert here on the topic. Uh, he's a high school friend and a local astro imager friend of mine, and uh, he's the director of IT services at Marshall University, and he's modified successfully 13 cameras, including three or four of mine. And uh, so it's please welcome Brent Maynard. Say hi, Brent. Good morning, Jeff. Thanks for having me on your, on your chat. Um, thank you for uh, stopping by. We really appreciate you. We got the chat room open. I'm monitoring the chat. So, uh, and after I hit the go live button, it seems like things are working a lot better now. <laughs> so, uh, sorry about that, Brent. That's my apologies on uh, getting this thing restarted. This is our first live broadcast, so... But I think we've got some great information for you. Hang in there with us. We're going to answer some questions and uh, go, down the, uh, go down this topic. So I think first, Brent, we need to start off with the disclaimer, right? Any, any first steps down this roadway, you are voiding your warranties, right? That is correct. As soon as you remove the first screw out of your camera, you have voided, you have voided all warranties for that camera. But the good news is I've done this uh, 12, 13 times, and I've, they've all been successful. See, it's it can really, be done. Really, I got to tell you, <laughs> Brent is very good at this. <laughs> uh, it's more intimidating than it, than it actually is. Right. Uh, we'll show you some pictures, and uh, we'll help you maybe hold your hand in some of that intimidation. But this is not going to be a, a walkthrough or a how-to, just a, an overview of the experience and the benefits and some of the uh, challenges uh, that you might face and maybe some of the, the ways to navigate in and around those potential challenges. So, Brent, let's get into that uh, what is meant by modifying a camera. And, uh, I think we had some pictures I wanted to... Uh, kind of supplement your conversation around that. Uh, so, what what are we taking out? What are we what are we leaving in? What are we putting back in? What what happens so this, here? So, this is a Canon RP, and this is the actual sensor array uh, after we dismantle the camera. And on most uh, cameras, uh, DSLRs or mirrorless cameras like the uh, RP, there are two filters. Uh, that are installed in, uh, during manufacturing. Uh, one is a UV IR cut filter, and it has strong cutoff lines uh, around 400 nanometers in the UV and about 720 nanometers up in the IR. And the second filter, the one that we want to remove, and you can see it there on your screen, which has a greenish cast to it, is an absorption filter. And that's the one that absorbs most of the hydrogen alpha line and makes the standard DSLR not that sensitive to uh, the hydrogen alpha emission line, uh, which we want uh, for uh, our astrophotography. 
So that's the one that we remove, is the um, IR absorption filter, UV IR absorption filter. Yeah, this was camera 13 modification, and Brent sent me some pictures during surgery, and I, we already kind of discussed this before I forgot to hit the go live button, uh, in that this is deep into the surgery, right? Yes, you, know, you basically have to take the camera apart. Um, you take out the uh, take off the back. You take off the main board. There's some ribbon cables you have to disconnect. And um, as you can see, there's a fair number of screws. But to keep track of where they go, it's, it's pretty easy to put them all back together. And the goal is to get that sensor package out so that we can take it apart to remove that one filter. And the one filter is actually between the uh, rejection filter on the outside and the sensor on, on the inside. And Brent, one of the other topics I wanted to make sure we emphasized is the benefit that you get out of modifying the camera. And uh, Brent and I have talked a little bit about this before the broadcast. And there's, while a stock camera has some hydrogen alpha sensitivity, uh, this is a great resource that I ran across. Jerry Rodriguez, his website is fantastic, uh, Catching the Light. It's a, it's a slightly older uh, web page re review, but I think it's very pertinent. What he does here, he takes a stock 60D on a dumbbell nebula, which is a multispectral object, not necessarily heavy with hydrogen alpha influence like many of the objects that we're going to be uh, imaging. But as you can see, he compares the stock 60D versus a 60DA, the Canon stock modified astronomical camera. And he also has a modified T2i. And he did this under very controlled circumstances. And he goes into detail. I have the link in the description section of the broadcast link. And he goes into the signal to noise ratio the improvement that is there. And it was slightly better, actually, with the T2i. Uh, so we aren't sure what Canon DAs. Right, Brent, we, they may be putting another slightly more open hydrogen alpha filter, but maybe they're limiting it to some degree? I, I imagine they still have some type of filter in there for the, 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 the reason that that one filter is there, the absorption filter, is, you know, it's color correcting. You know, our eyes are more sensitive to green, um, the green wavelengths. And if you look at that filter curve for that, that filter that we removed, it really lets a lot of the green, blue light pass through and really starts cutting into the red. And that's just for that's for taking landscape pictures and things like that, not necessarily for doing astrophotography. My guess is that they put a second filter in there that opens that up a little bit more. Right. For the hydrogen alpha. And just from our perspective, Brent and I, we're have you ever put a non modified DSLR on a long focal length for astro uh, imaging, Brent? I have not. I've always just done a modified. Yeah, same here. So we didn't have a library of befores and afters. Our dark sky time is just so precious that uh, when we go, we got to go full bore. But here's one of the comparisons I have. It's not perfect. It's uh, not the same conditions, not the same lens even. But it is a wide field. It even shows in a wide field. This is with a modified camera. And uh, so that's a wide field Milky Way. And, and the comparison is this. This is a non-modified Canon camera. Uh, that's the RP before modification. Actually, I have another one here. This is a Sony a7R 3 And while I would love to have had a modified camera at this location, I didn't. And I, I just, again, it's not a perfect comparison, but I believe the red sensitivity, even in a wide field landscape use, is of benefit for, for these cameras. So to answer the question, is there a benefit to enhancing I believe the I believe the answer is yes. I believe the benefit is is mainly in terms of time needed to capture the the signal. And Jerry Rodriguez goes into that with his article. Canon claims four times more sensitivity to the hydrogen alpha line with a Canon R A versus a Canon R. So it's it's really just improving the signal to noise and reducing the amount of exposure time needed to get the same total exposure. Uh, signal that you're looking for versus a non-modified camera. Does that sum it up, Brent? Are we pretty good there? Yes. And I think you touched on a little bit the UVIR filter. Um, for the most part, the belief is that we are not 
uh, we are not removing the UV IR filters in most of these modern Canon cameras. We're just leaving those in place uh, unless you really want a full spectrum camera to image in the infrared, right? That, that's correct. I mean, some people like doing the UV uh, photography or like, like, like doing infrared photography. So they'll do a full spectrum mod, but I'll leave the filter in because that, that, I'm really just on master photography. Do most of these resources we're going to show, share later and on the link, do they also get into uh, the decision point on the Astro mod versus the full spectrum mod and, and what to do there? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I think we've, we talked earlier as well. I do think it's something to consider. So if you do the full spectrum mod, you're going to have to use for your Astro photography some type of UV IR filter in the, in the imaging train, right? That's correct. And it could be a clip-in filter. Maybe you could use a two-inch filter, but I can say a couple of my concerns there are every piece of glass you put in that imaging train is a potential for reflection. And some of those clip-ins, if you have a Canon EF-S lens, that lens seats too deeply into the body, and I don't believe it can even uh, mount properly if you have a clip-in uh, filter in the body. Is that correct? Yeah, for the, with the Canon lenses. With the uh, Canon that, lenses. That, that's a problem. It's problematic. And we're very Canon-centric, and I apologize if you come in to this with a Pentax or a Nikon or even a Sony uh, background, but uh, the resources, and Brent and I, we just committed to Canon on this uh, several years ago. <laughs> So, uh, but there are resources on the other cameras. I'm guessing there's a fair amount of crossover similarity to all the points we're discussing with those. But uh, there, I'm sure there's going to be enough differences too. You would definitely want to uh, find a very specific step-by-step -step instruction on the camera body that you have. Yes, and I think the, can uh, the Nikons in particular use the same filter techniques that Canon does. You know, they put two filters in. And the mods, you, know, you remove the one uh, to increase your sensitivity to hydrogen alpha. Okay. I see some really good Nikon uh, modded on the Astro Ben page. Um, I don't know that I've seen a lot of Sony modded. I had that Sony A7R3 for a brief period of time, and I have to tell you, it was just a beautiful camera. And to think that that could be Astro modified, I think it would just be amazing. But again, that's a, a very, again, you're always going to have to answer the question about the value uh, risk and, and where is your balancing point and do you want to risk a $2,000 camera body to this on your own? I, I'm not even aware of any of the modding websites. Do they offer a Sony mod? I think I've seen Nikon mods. Um, that, that one site, Color Vision May. Okay. Uh, offer a Sony mod, but I, I'm not sure. Okay. So I just wanted to apologize. We're going to be very Canon centric <laughs> for the remainder of this conversation. Uh, maintaining autofocus, Brent. That's one other question I had. Uh, what do you have to do, if anything, to maintain autofocus with Canon lenses? So for the older uh, cameras, like the Rebel series, the TX series, the 3, the 4, the 5, the 6, uh, 7, the T7, all the Rebel series uh, cameras. Uh, if you want to maintain autofocus, uh, you either need to put uh, some, after you take the one filter out, you need to replace it with uh, a piece of glass, either clear glass, or you could put another UV IR uh, cut filter in there that has the same refractive index, the same thickness, and you get the sensor back in the same location, and then your uh, autofocus uh, can be maintained if you want to use it for like point and shoot uh, during the daytime. Um, with the RP, the, the latest one that I've done, I've done two Canon RPs, uh, one for Jeff and one for myself. And the autofocus, uh, the, I think the focusing technique with those mirrorless lenses are different. You know, it uses those focus pixels on the sensor. So I didn't have to do anything special to um, position the sensor in the right location or put any additional glass back in to keep the focal plane at the same location. And so with the newer cameras, it seems uh, you don't need to worry about that. Um, and I not had any issues. Uh, and I still use my RP uh, for daylight shots. I just have to do some color correction. Right. Uh, use custom white balance or something like that. <clears throat> it takes great daytime photos, uh, even with that with the filter gone. 
Right, right. You have to do some little post post processing on your daylight, just like you did your astro images. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. I remember Bryn has done, I think, I don't know, a T1i, a T3i, a T5i, and an RP for me. And I remember I was having a conversation about autofocus, and I remember you telling me you had to do some glass uh, replacement just to maintain an autofocus with Canon cameras, but it's that's pretty amazing what technology they're using today to, to maintain that. Time. So, Brent, what is the easiest camera? What's the easiest camera to modify so far? And have you modified every Rebel? I've, I've done a 300, and I've done the, the 400D, uh, which was a precursor to the T1i. The 450, I did the 400, the 450, the T1, the 2, the 3, the 4, the 5, and then I've done the T3 and the T6, and also the T, I think it was the T1000 or the T1100, all the Rebel series, and then I've done the, uh, the RP, and uh, by far the easiest is the Canon RP. This Whoa, is really? This camera. Yes. Wow, that's amazing. And the, the main reason, um, the hardest part of doing the mod, the most challenging, is getting the ribbon cables back into their um, connectors. Uh, just them getting them, oh. Can you bend and a pin or something? Is that the risk? No, it's just trying to get it, uh, just, you know, they're all ribbon cables with the flat surface, with the flat connector, and just trying to get those all seated properly. And on, especially the Rebel Series, some of those ribbon cables are hard to get to, very, uh, tight corners you have to get around to try to slide those back in the, in the into the connectors with the rp it's all laid out it's everything's easy it's just easy wow. to get cables off it's easy to get the cables back in so relatively speaking how much easier than like a t3i this is me asking personally <laughs> it um i it probably takes me a half an hour to 45 minutes longer to do the T3 or two, you know, the T, TX series, then the RP, just because of um, space is it is is a little bit of a function of space, space to work and in, then, and, then, and 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 in reality, just getting up and walking away because you're sitting there so close, mm -hmm. trying to maneuver these ribbon cables on some of the older cameras that are a little. I mean, I've, I've wow. always got them back in, but the RP has been the easiest. Well, you've kind of changed my whole perspective. I was coming into this thinking that Jeff might modify a T3i, and now I'm like, my advice would be to watch the Canon RP prices and refurbished or used and pick up an RP. We'll look, we're going to look at that here in a little bit, pricing and value and what might be recommended. So, And the, and the T3 the T, and the T4 and T5, they're not, they're not that hard. You know, there's, it's just, there's just a little bit, there's that. A little extra challenge of getting those ribbon cables in and seated properly that you don't have on the RP. Well, that's actually my next topic, Brent, is I was going to dive right into uh, right into that value proposition. So uh, we were on these web pages earlier. We had uh, we had KEH up here, and we were just doing a search and looking at some of the modded uh, some of the bodies that were available. Um, I mean, you have some options here, Brent. Sub one hundred dollar frame uh, bodies. I'm sorry, sub one hundred dollar bodies that you could potentially modify with very little risk uh, in money, and just a great, you know, uh, make it type of experience for yourself. If you had that, here's a T4i, uh, two hundred sixty six dollars, and <clears throat> so I, I think that. But what you pointed out to me earlier, if you go onto the Canon refurbished website, here's a refurbished RP body for $800. That's a full frame camera. And if you're saying that's potentially one of the easiest uh, bodies to, to modify, then wow, that really jumps out at me as a very strong value proposition um, for, uh, for the best value in modifying your own camera. I was surprised when I when I went through the process of doing the um, the RP. Uh, the other thing to take into consideration, if anybody's interested in picking a camera to to, to do this on, you know, the T3i is probably the, uh, the 
best value uh, in that you get the articulating screen, which uh, this comes in very handy uh, the older you get. So you don't have to get down on your knees and look up through the, the viewfinder. Or with the articulated screen, you can position it to whatever angle that you need it to be. And um, so that's one that uh, really helped um, with, the, you know, live view, autofocus, you know, focusing uh, makes focusing it's much easier with the articulated screen. Right. Um, and the RP has the articulated screen. All the, everything after the T3i series has the articulated screen. Yeah, that articulate. I remember when that came out, Brent, we were as giddy as Christmas Day when that articulating screen came out. We had spent a lot of time in very awkward positions looking at the back of a screen uh, on that. So we were going to also, uh, Brent, talk a little bit about some resources that are out there. Uh, here's Hap Griffin. Uh, he has a resource for buying. I believe he doesn't have any tips on but he, he does the modifications. You can buy many cameras directly from him. He's a well-known name in the industry. Um, we also have this color vision. I believe that's the link that you said, Brent, had the uh, RP uh, available uh, for the modification yeah, the directions. Uh, yeah, it's got the, not really the directions on doing the mod. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a tear down. Oh, okay. Uh, so it basically shows you how to take the camera apart. But if you can take it apart, you can put it back together. And, uh, and it's but it, you can follow the, the do-it-yourself site, you know, which is like the the best resource on the web is Gary Honus's uh, site for doing the DSLR modifications. Yeah, here's Gary's and site. Goes, and It goes step-by-step, step, very yeah. detailed, and it, it is by far the best resource. It goes over the tools that you need, you know, different uh, things to consider for the, each individual type of camera. Now, this is primarily the uh, Canon T series, the T3i, mm -hmm. T3i. Right. You can see at the top there what he what he does. Now, I don't think he's, he hasn't updated this with any of the newer mirrorless cameras. Right. But, um, yeah, here's his main page, but and it's, it's, a, it's busy, but yeah, this page just has amazing information on it, and I don't know, I think somebody in the Novak group wasn't sure if he was still offering the modifications or not himself. He's not. Okay. Yeah, he, he's not doing that anymore. But what a resource, a great resource, like you said, on the T-Series. So that, that's just a great resource there. So we got Gary. Uh, Pat Nadolsky, I think, is the one who wrote the uh, breakdown article back to that uh, Color Vision page. Yes. And I, I have links to these resources we've just discussed in the description on the show notes. So please uh, check that out. And... So you've already kind of touched on one of these next topics, and that is some of the things to consider when, uh, when choosing a camera to modify or dedicate to astronomy, and that was being the articulating uh, screen. Uh, the resolution, what are we getting into? Of course, uh, most of these we've been talking about have been APS-C uh, cameras. Brent, can you remember the resolution progress that's happening up through the T3i up to the whatever? What was T7i? Was that the last Rebel? I think that's, I don't think, I don't know if they have the T8 out yet or not. I haven't looked recently since I kind of jumped over the full frame side of the house with the RP. But starting with the T1, I think the T1 was around 15 megapixel, uh, somewhere around there. And then the T2 uh, series, I think they jumped up to the 18 megapixel a APS-C size sensor. Um, you know, that's a, that's a, there's pros and cons to that. You have, you know, yeah. have pixels, but the pixels get smaller, which is which can become an issue um, because you have to really start cranking up the gain in order to get enough photons hitting those individual pixels. That's one thing that's really nice about the uh, RP is it's a 20, I think it's a 24 megapixel camera, but it's full frame. And so the pixels are relatively big. Are they five? Uh, they're, are they... they're close to five microns, I think, mm -hmm. uh, pixel size. And so it actually, there was one site, and I have to see if I could find it. There's one site that did some, uh, what the quantum efficiency is on all the cameras. And the RP <clears throat> rated is one of the highest quantum efficient cameras out there. Because yeah, I remember you making, bringing that up. Uh, I'm going to make a note, Brent, that I want to, I want to provide that as a, link in our resources on the quantum yeah, efficiencies. I'll, I'll find that link and I'll send it to you. I just now remembered that. But um, 
So that's one good thing about the RP. Now, the RP is the same, you know, according to people, this is not something that Canon has announced, but according to people that have done the you know, pixel peeping or whatever, that the RP sensor is the same as the Canon 6D Mark II. It's a, basically the same sensor okay. uh, on, that, on, that, on those two cameras. Okay. And there's lots of good Canon 6D Mark II images out there that you know, people have modified the 6D. And so you can kind of yeah. use that as a basis as well. There's not as many RP mods out there yet. But I think as people find out that it's fairly easy to modify, you might start seeing a lot of RP images out there. Well, the Canon RA, the full frame, uh, has just been fantastic to work with. I've seen a dramatic improvement in the signal to noise, less of that walking noise phenomenon that you can see in those APS-Cs. Uh, they're, they're all great, but now that we're having this conversation, I am definitely more inclined to really supporting if someone can take the risk on that RP and find the value and feel comfortable with that. Wow, what a what a great uh, value, I think, in getting a full frame. Now, here's, here's a tip. Here's a tip that you can do. They still do this with Canon. Uh, this is, I don't know if Nikon does something similar, but if you have an old point and shoot camera, an old Canon, you know, sure shot or whatever, whatever these, uh, all, any old camera that you might have, you can call the Canon loyalty hotline. And that's another resource I'll give you the link. I'll give you the, the number for that. Okay. Good up. But it's an 800 number that you call. And you say that you have an old camera that you would like to uh, send in to recycle, and you can uh, they will look on the refurbished store and they will see what cameras they will give you an additional discount on. And sometimes that's been as high as 25%. So you look at the refurbished price, and sometimes they'll take 10% off of that. Sometimes they'll take 20% off of that, or even up to 25% off of that price. So it actually helps get the camera even even cheaper. Wow. And that's what I usually do is I. I have, you know, I've always had some old cameras around, some old... Uh, I have a Canon Elon 2. I wonder if they'll uh, give me any credit on that. It's my <laughs> last... Give it, a, give, it a, give it a shot. It was my last film camera, uh, point-and-shoot film camera. Thank you. That's a great tip. Uh, the other thing, Brent, we wanted to uh, kind of dovetail onto this section was... Another consideration for a camera, and that is you and I have both experienced what I call the ASI Air Revolution. And uh, I, I think it's important to consider now, of course, we've been, you, you've kind of been moving me down the RP path, but I got to tell you, Brent and I are working on another little rabbit hole project, and that is getting a Wi Fi connection to these full frame cameras from Canon. Uh, via Astro Barry or Stellar, Stellar Mate. Uh, I'm struggling with that topic. But uh, this is the point. The ASI Air has been, has revolutionized for me the convenience and ease of access at the scope, uh, the reliability of my gear at the scope. So if that's important for you, you need to make sure what the camera you select is in the supported ASI Air camera bodies. Now, Brent, I, I really struggled in finding an updated list. I think this list is a little bit old, uh, but they, they've been promising an updated uh, models, but they seem to be hesitant on doing that. I, am I correct on that, current from the ASI yeah. Air? Um, we're, we're hoping there are several people out on the uh, Facebook page, the ASI Air Facebook group, that keep requesting the Canon R series. And uh, same thing on the Nikon side, that they seem to be lacking on support for the mirrorless cameras so far, but they keep coming back saying that it's, it's coming. So we're, hope, we're hopeful that the next release of the software will support the Canon R series. And that would well, include the RA and the RP. Well, I can't tell you so far my experience, and I know it gets into those ND drivers, and I'm uh, very much a novice on this. Again, just to reemphasize, Brent is IT director at Marshall University. This is his specialty, <laughs> and he could probably walk me down this uh, when he starts to get some time in on it. But I've had trouble. I don't think those drivers are because uh, Brent and I had speculated that ASI Air was being reluctant on adding support to cameras that may be competitors to their newer camera offerings, especially ASI ZWO has started going down the full frame camera route. 
So, but I don't know, Brent, those Indy drivers don't seem to be real stable or I, I, maybe I just don't know how to work with that Raspberry Pi interface very well yet. It's somewhat complicated, but that, I don't know if you're, and I've, I've been reading some things on the boards and I don't see a whole lot of success rate in people uh, getting those uh, Ecos imaging software to really talk with uh, the RPs or RAs, I should say. I've been working with the RA. Yeah, the, I, I, the one time I tried it, I had that one time to really dig into it, and it, it worked okay for my first test, but I haven't done any long exposure. Yeah, and that's the problem. You could you can get live view, and you can you can actually take some exposures, but there's there's some funky things that start happening. I, I, my point is, I haven't got it to where it's reliable yet. Every time I talk to you about imaging. You, you have to understand, I want something that is flawless in the field and is incredibly reliable. I've spent too many star party nights watching people get frustrated with their equipment and not getting anything done. So when I take something out into the field, I want it to work. I know nothing's 100%, but I want it to be as assured as possible and have some uh, redundancies built in. So bottom line is, if you have a camera you want modified for astronomy work and you are an ASI Air fan and have that system or you want to go down that road for having remote control of your camera and your scope, please make sure you're using an ASI uh, model that is supported with the drivers. Okay, here's where I have my question. Maybe people weren't uh, listening, Brent, a minute ago, but... Uh, I was going to ask about the first Canon camera that did have that articulating screen. And uh, Brent did mention the T3i, but there was actually, I believe, a, another camera that had it slightly before. Uh, this is, uh, so if you know that answer, put it into chat. Which Canon camera had the first articulating screen? And that's a pretty important feature that we really recommend. Uh, and so, I, Brent, I just had some things here. We've covered the resources, uh, questions. Oh, Brent, what about non-Canon cameras? We've been very Canon-centric, and I know you briefly touched on it earlier. We think Nikon has a fairly good support database for modification. Not sure about Sony. and not. I've seen some Pentax on uh, AstroBin. And I believe they were modified. Boy, I mean, a Pentax 645 modified, how sweet would that be? Of course, your optical instruments always have to support the resolution and frame that your camera's going to give you. But uh, uh, I've, I've actually seen the Sony A7, uh, A7S series. I've seen, I've seen a couple of those where people have modified. I, I don't know how they did. I think they were probably self-modified. I've not seen any services that do it, but maybe that color vision might do that because they do. Yeah, let's. They, uh, they have a tear down. They have tear downs for all kinds of cameras. I don't know. Let's go through the process. Just check real quick apart. to see if uh, that color vision. I think they had a pretty convenient database listed there um, of what they were offering. So I'm seeing, sir, so there's a Sony. There's your Sony A7. I'm assuming that's being offered as a modification. Uh, oh, yeah. okay. So that that's their, uh, they will mod it for, okay. There's your modification for your Sony for color vision. Okay. Yeah, you pick, pick what kind of mod that you want and then um, you send them your camera and then they'll send it back to you. Okay. Yeah, but what fun is that, right? We want to, <laughs> we want this picture. <laughs> this is what we want <laughs> in our home, <laughs> at our desk. Uh, goodness, Brent. It looks like, so, you know, kind of jump back to that. Um, maybe you have a, a resource site. I, I don't have it listed yet in the description, but of how, where to get maybe the right tools. And you have this tape here. And do you have, is this just a, a board? Uh, is this a specific board uh, that you use here to to break everything down on? That is a Dollar Tree foam board. So that's Absolutely it's perfect. Foam, it's just foam board. And um, so what I do is I just take a piece of masking tape 
or you know, and then put it not masking tape, but uh, just a piece of uh, cell phone tape, and then just put the sticky side up uh, on there, and that way. Uh, and anchor it here with some. Well, I just kind of turn the ends down so that it's stuck, uh -huh. and then okay. I stick everything that comes out of the camera. I stick to that so that they don't get lost. Um, some people make little trays. If you're going to do this for you know for a lot of cameras, some people make like a little tray. And they'll put the screws in each individual slot. But the the tools, uh, really, the, the, the main tools. While you're talking, are, Brent, so what I think I might do is show your uh, show your video. Okay. The uh, the tools uh, you need a, a, a set of uh, really good fine uh, screwdrivers. You know, like the uh, and there's there's two screwdrivers that there are two uh, heads that we use on this. Uh, one's Phillips and then a Torx 6 or Torx 7, depending on the, on the, on the model of the camera. Uh, and that basically is the only two uh, drivers that you need, is a Phillips and a Torx. Just make sure they're good quality. Um, I got the kit that I'm using um, on Amazon for it was like $16, $17. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty nice little set for doing this type of work. Then you need a pair of uh, tweezers uh, to help with some of the ribbon cables. And these little uh, plastic uh, tools that uh, come for doing uh, iPhone repair. I've repaired some of my kids' iPhone screens where they break them. And so you need these lift up tools. That's the little plastic tools you see there in the video the green and the blue. Mm -hmm. And those help pull up some of the connectors. Uh, there's little clip in, little clips that hold the ribbon cables in place. So you use those tools to just uh, clip them up. And then uh, the last tool uh, that you and you'll, you'll see it coming up here. I'm taking the outer filter off there. And um, then once I get the outer filter off, you'll see that the we're down to the green filter. And then we, I just use a razor blade and gingerly. Uh, slide that razor blade around to, to lift that filter up. Mm -hmm. This is the most uh, critical process right here, is making sure you don't uh, do anything to the uh, underlying uh, sensor. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, the good thing is the sensor is covered with filter, or it's, uh, it's covered glass. So there's, there's glass over top of the actual sensor. And then just putting everything back together again with those, uh, with the Phillips screwdriver or the Torx. This is putting the sensor array back in the camera and uh, positioning it back. You can see some notes that I made on the board there about where these screws are located. There are three screws holding the sensor array in place. And I basically am indexing where those screws need to go back in to make sure that the, uh, that the sensor is still in the, in the correct plane. So it's not, uh, shifted in any one direction or the other so that I don't uh, have any issues with uh, one part of the frame being out of focus. So that's why we make sure that I get those screws back in the exact location that I want them to be back into. So that's what some of the notes are there on the board. And then this is just doing the reassembly, just going back, you know, it's just the opposite uh, direction, just putting all the screws back in. And um, yeah, there's some uh, couple little places you have to take the rubber housing on this image here you can see that it's shifted to the red which is good uh, we've, we've changed that and these are some images that I took with my modified RP uh, here in my uh, driveway uh, here in Hurricane West Virginia and uh, it, it really does make a huge difference in the hydrogen apple sensitivity I have a link to Brent's YouTube page and to this video specifically and I think it's amazing this thank you so much for putting that together and that was just done that's what that's how Brent spent his Thanksgiving uh, holiday <laughs> uh, thank you so it, it much took, it, it takes about an hour an hour time to, to do the from start to finish you want you everything kind of set and ready to go uh, it takes about an hour to do the model. It's very intimidating looking to me. I have to be honest. And uh, to someone like you, like you said, you, you've you been down this road now several times. And uh, I'm glad to have you as a resource if I ever consider uh, going down this. But uh, 
And I still think I might entertain that T3i somewhere around that model range uh, type of an attempt because uh, oh, they're, 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 they're not that much harder. It just they, you, you can get you just have sometimes you have to get up and kind of walk away, let your eyes relax, right? Because you know, you're down there, you know, looking at some really fine details, and so sometimes it's just good just to get up and walk away. So you're you're saying like a first timer, the time commitment you would expect. Uh, what what would you think of a first timer sitting down to do this? Time commitment breaks. Well, let's work in some breaks. Fifteen minute break uh, every fifteen minutes, maybe. For your very first modification, if you follow like Gary Honus's website and you have the step by step, it's going to take you two or three hours. Mm -hmm. Your first time. Right. Um, once you build the skills you know, and you do a couple, then then you know what to look for. You know what to do. Right. You know, you're not sitting there reading instructions. You know, two or three times. You know, yes. Which, which, which screw are you talking about? Yeah. You know, so it does. Yeah. The first mod does take longer, just because you are focusing really heavily on the instructions. Yeah. Yeah. I would. Uh, I would be very intimidated by it, but I think. Thank you. You're giving us hope that we could. Uh, we could do it. Uh, is there a uh, a Canon camera that is not possible to be modified? Not that I'm aware of. I think all the models uh, that have come out at any given point in time have been um, have been modified. They, um, I've never I've never seen or heard of one that's not been able to be modified. I think people get a little uh, careful when you start dealing with the Canon, you know, D Mark. You know, the Canon D Mark One or One or whatever, where they're you know, you're talking about a four or five thousand dollar camera box. But I've even seen some of those have been modded. Uh, but that's a lot of money that you're putting on the line. <laughs> uh, but if you know, if, if, if you've got the resources to do that, then people. But I've seen where people have modded. Uh, they've all been modded, as far as I know. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Um, so let's get into some questions. We had some questions come in, and I think we've kind of been at least around the edges of answering most of these and um, let me see if I can pull that up again Go to notes. so David Stokes from Novas asked uh, he wanted some before and after examples and I think for me that one of the better uh, is uh, the Jerry Rodriguez page that we shared with you earlier uh, where Jerry goes over the um, the D, the uh, 60 uh, DA and uh, if I didn't close that window <laughs> I may have closed the window no there it is so the 60 DA the uh, 60 D stock and the modified T2i I think those are great examples and again what Jerry did here all the exact same control parameters same ex total exposure time no, f I don't believe he used any type of a uh, light pollution filter on these at all. That's a whole other topic. But I believe these were totally unfiltered, just the modifications, total exposure time, and you can just see that the signal of the 60 uh, DA and the T2I is for the hydrogen alpha again in a multispectral object like the dumbbell significantly increased for the same amount of time. So I think that's our best uh, before and after. The other question, clip-in filters. Did we get into clip-in filters yet, Brent? We've kind of done this presentation twice now. <laughs> I don't remember if we talked about clip-ins on this. Well, the, uh, what I do is I use the uh, SCT dual-band clip-in filter. I live in a fairly light polluted location here in West Virginia, so it helps me be able to do um, you know, three to five minute exposures uh, to really pull in some signal. Uh, I could not do that uh, normally without the filter just because uh, my, I'd be overexposed in just a couple of minutes um, just because of light pollution. Now, if we can get up into the mountains of West Virginia, up around Spruce Knob or Blackwater Falls or Green Bank, I uh, don't need to use a filter because uh, the skies are so dark that you don't need to worry about it. But here, I'm always using the uh, clip-in filter for the most part, uh, unless I'm going after some galaxies. And then I'll just, you know, when the, during the winter time when it's, you know, the moisture levels are down in the atmosphere, so I don't get as much sky glow. I can do some uh, some decent galaxy work in the winter time. 
without a filter. Yes, I uh, agree. Uh, the STC dual narrowband filter is amazing. I have used it uh, in both APS-C size sensors and full frame, and it has worked wonderfully. You can be very creative with the filter, getting it more close to a, an RGB type presentation if you want, or you can even start to play around with the Hubble palette type of color mapping. And so it's fantastic. I, I love the STC. I do have the uh, Optolong L Enhance uh, 2 inch that I'm hoping to experiment with here a little bit, but this is getting a little bit off topic, but you don't have to use those clip-in filters, obviously, if you're, like Brent said, at a dark sky. If you do the full spectrum modification and you are looking for a clip-in UV IR filter, I believe Astronomic makes those clip systems for almost every can and body type. And so that can be on their website. So and they show you, I've had Astronomic filters in the past. Uh, I can tell you again, just to reemphasize, Every piece of glass in an optical train is potential for reflection. Now, I've, so it, you may have one optical system that doesn't reflect back off of that clip-in filter, and you may have one that does. I know I have, uh, I have a refractor with a focal reducer, field flattener, and in that arrangement, I did have some reflection on one of my clip-in filters. I can't remember exactly what it was. And of course, all the coatings on all of these optics can obviously play a difference. but uh, So you'll just have to experiment with your optical train with the clip-in filter. And uh, if you get reflection with one, maybe experiment with another brand or manufacturer and do the best research you can on coatings uh, that's available online. Now if you scroll down on that page uh, to the clip-in filters, uh, you can see uh, on down, keep on going. Yeah, keep on keep on heading on down. Yeah, so you can see right there that CLS filter. Yes. Um, that that's the color correcting filter. So that's the same filter that we take out. So if you want to put your camera if after doing a modification, and you want to put it back into being able to do point and shoot without having to do the color correcting and all that kind of stuff, that's the type of clip-in filter that you can put in. Excellent. To recorrect your color balance. So if you want to use it for, still for daytime shooting without having to worry about post-processing, then you can, uh, or custom white balance. Exactly. I think that's a good thing. I mean, do you always want to pull every photo into Lightroom Photoshop and do the correction? You know, maybe not. I mean, it takes time. So, yeah, the better in-camera you can get. I've not used it, but, um, I mean, and you can even do your own uh, color balance, have a fixed color balance in-camera. But uh, I, I think it's a, it's a good thing. Maybe I ought to look at that a little bit more, Brent. Uh, I don't do that a whole lot. And Oh, Brent, here's a very important question uh, that uh, David asked. What can go wrong with the mod? The, the most common thing that I've had that, that I've seen, and it's happened to me a couple times, is you know I put the camera back together and, and something's not working, like one of the buttons isn't working or... Uh, you know, so what I have to do is uh, take it back apart, and so it's always the ribbon cables. And so I'll reseat the ribbon cables and okay. make sure that they all have good connection. And there was one time I did one, and it's a, it was uh, I talked to Gary about it. Actually, Gary, I, I sent Gary an email said, "Hey, this happened. What, have you seen this before?" And he said, "Oh yeah, that happens." It was like one of the T1000 series where the ribbon cable naturally wants to flip over. And so when you take it out, it flips, it flips over uh, 180 degrees. So when you go to put it back in, you're putting it back in upside down. You have to flip it back over again because it's, it's, it's they're kind of springy. Um, so it, so I, I just flipped it back over and, and just flipped it back yeah, in the proper way. I just wanted to double check my notes, Brent. Uh, this day was actually looking at a, modifying a Canon 60D that he has currently. Do you know anything specifically about uh, the 60D and? Um, not that, not off the top of my head, I've not done the 60D. Uh, I can't remember if Gary has done that on his site, showing how to Don't do the, the 50, 60, 70D series. Right. But uh, some of those, uh, on the older cameras, 
There were a couple of places where they had RF interference shields built into the camera, just just pieces pieces of uh, metal housing to go around the sensor, and those were typically soldered in in a couple of points. So you had to, you know, basically get a solder you know, soldering iron to loosen those soldering joints to be able to pull that RF shield away. Uh, but the new cameras don't have that. I don't know if the 60 uh, D does or not. It doesn't look, look like he has that list. It didn't look like it. I didn't see it off the top. Do you think this... Uh... That would be the only thing that would be different. Uh, on some of, the, some of the older cameras, they may have some RF shields that require uh, loosening a couple of soldered joints. Mm -hmm. They're not, they're not you know, electrically conductive. They're just holding it in place. Okay. So it's a, it's a, it's a solder, desolder and a resolder. Yeah. For that to get it back yeah. in. Okay. But that's, but that's going to be on an older camera. And I've only seen that once and that was really on the, on the 300, the 300 D, the old, you know, the original rebel XT, um, 300 and 350 had those soldering, um, shields in there. Yeah. And, um, uh, that's great. Uh, we have one other question from Clear Sky Photography on Instagram. Again, it was just talking about clip-in filters. So there's a lot of interest in the clip-in filters and what do you need to use. Uh, obviously, so based on our discussion, if you're modifying, if you get to that decision point on your mod and you decide, I want an Astro camera, I don't want infrared then you really are not looking at needing a clip-in filter of any kind. That's correct. If you leave the one UV IR cut filter in place, and that's all I've ever done. I've always just left that filter in place. And um, if I'm not using a clip-in filter for narrow band imaging, then or just you know it works. It works fine. I don't have any issues with uh, you know UV or IR light bleeding in. Because uh, it's a it's a very strong cut filter. Okay. That's already in the camera. If you're going full spectrum, which we don't have the experience with, if you're going full spectrum, then you're going to have to consider that clip-in filter, UVIR, somewhere in the imaging train. I guess you could use a two-inch UVIR filter. Yes. In your imaging train somewhere, um, and again, if you're having a reflection with a clip-in then maybe consider a two inch somewhere in your imaging train and vice versa. So if you, if you start to run into problems there, there there's multiple ways to, to handle challenges uh, with these reflections. So uh, don't, don't ever just give up if you're getting a reflection with one filter in one place, consider maybe another brand, another make, another size and a different position on your imaging train. Um, let's see, Brent. I think that answers all of our questions. I didn't get an answer onto the website on the chat for our question about the first camera to have the articulating screen. And my resources online are showing the 60D was the first with the articulating screen. So back to Dave's camera, what a great camera to mod, probably that 60D. I don't know the resolution on that camera, but um, it's the 18 megapixel, I believe. Okay. I the the um, one thing that people have also found out, and this is fairly consistent the uh, 50 starting with the I think we're starting with the 50 D the 50 the 60 and the 70 D uh, use the same basic sensor that the rebel series use uh, so this it's the same fundamentally the same sensor as the t3 the t4 the t5 uh, cameras are all the same sensor as well as the 60 the 50 the 70 uh, the reason you paid more for the 60 or the 70s, you know, the, you can have more functionality on the, in the firmware, you know, the camera bodies, you know, waterproof, you know, things like that. So, uh, but the, the underlying sensor is pretty much the same in, the, in, those, in those cameras. Brent, thank you. This has been amazing. As you can tell, Brent is an expert and I thank him very much for joining us. I am going to update the resources in the description for the broadcast. Uh, with some of the things I made note of. There are already a lot of links in there about things we've talked about. Uh, I think uh, Brent has maybe caused me to reconsider a APS size mod and going for a full frame mod. Why not, right? Um, 
it's a great project and I think what Brent does is amazing on these things and uh, he does make it look way too easy I, I think you're probably right on the three hour window for a first timer on a mod uh, just to have an expectation but it's kind of encouraging that it sounds like that ribbon seating is the biggest challenge in terms of making sure you get that right yeah that's that was always uh, kind of the, the toughest part making sure you got those all back in and taking them out, but this camera is just just easy, uh, easier than than the previous cameras. I was so, surprised. I thought it'd be more complex. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> oh, I would. I would think it would be around that uh, that sensor housing. Uh, some something get messed up there. Now you showed a great technique. Now remember, I have a link to that time lapse that Brent put together on the description section. So I think that's a great little visual, especially on. Maybe that technique on the removal, is that a common technique you have to use with the razor blade? Yeah, you have to use a razor blade. On uh, any? Very, you could use a, you could use a, a very fine edged uh, knife blade as well and just go around. What you don't want to do is break the filter um, because when you break the filter, then you run the risk. Now of you're going the, into the middle of the, the, the the device, right, and trying yeah, and to then you, get... you might get little glass shards on oh, the yeah. glass. Yeah. You got to make sure you get that all cleaned off. And so yeah. it's, it's best just to take it, you know, easy and slow through there. And um, and if it is problematic, I've had to do this on I think it was like the T1 series, or the T1000 series. There was a camera I modded uh, for that one time, and I um, the that double sided tape was extremely tacky. You know, it wasn't wanting to release, so I just um, took a blow dryer and yeah. it up just okay. a little bit, just okay. to get it a little bit soft. Right. Uh, same technique you would use on you know repairing an iPhone or something. You got to get that glue a little loose, and it, it makes it pop off a lot. Easier. So you have replaced an iPhone screen? Uh, it's been a while back. I don't. Okay. Know <laughs> So, uh, yeah, Brent's a great expert on this. So thanks so much for joining me. Hey, if there's a topic or conversation you'd like uh, to see me host or maybe lead, drop it in the chat or drop me a line. You know how to get with me. Again, I have a link to Brent's YouTube. Any other ways to get in touch with you, Brent, I need to include if you'd like. I got your YouTube yeah, just link. Keep, just, you know, my YouTube or you can, uh, I don't I have problems with email, just brent.maynard at marshall.edu. Yeah. Brent's a great resource, and uh, you know I hope we get back to the live uh, uh, Star Party world in, in 2021, and uh, we'll, maybe we can all gather around and have these in-person conversations. So, thank you to Brent for joining me. I appreciate you greatly. Thanks for joining the broadcast today, and uh, I hope good luck with your modification. And it's a great time, I think, to get a value in a camera that can be modified for astronomy that you can do yourself. What a great little maker project that uh, I think is very rewarding. So, uh, Brent, I'm going to say thank you. And thank you, uh, Jeff. everybody on the broadcast, thank you for subscribing and liking and uh, clear skies.